Thank you very much. Let me just say at the outset, uh, I'm really grateful for, to, for the chance to be here. My uh, sister actually used to be uh, in the university here in the School of Architecture, and she's not there now, but I've been to Minnesota several times to, to visit her along the way and have always enjoyed being here. When I told my wife I was coming, she was insistent that I carry my heavy overcoat. Uh, <laughs> but I persuaded her that I shouldn't, and I was right, because you've really rolled out the Seattle weather for me, so thank you, thank you very much. But really, I, I, a great privilege, a great honor to, to be with you. What I want to talk uh, about uh, today is uh, something that I call a theology for business. Uh, and if, in a professional sense, I would say this has really been my overarching passion for the last decade. And, and really the challenge for me to, today is going to be to try to take a decade's worth of passion and put it into a 40, 45 minute talk, but I'm, I'm going to try to do that. Let me tell you a little bit uh, about what I mean when I say a theology for business. It, it, it's a little more than this, but for purposes today, I want to focus on two questions. Why? That is, why is business done? from God's perspective, and then how? How should it be done looking again from God's perspective? Sometimes I translate these into questions of purpose and practice. What is the purpose of business? And then how should business be practiced? But before I turn to these questions, I want to tell you a little bit about why I, I am so animated about this subject. And, and frankly, it's in part because of some real challenges I see that are out there, but also because of a real opportunity. Uh, the challenge is uh, I have discovered uh, really in connection with my role as dean. As, as you might guess, uh, as the dean of a business school, uh, an awful lot of my job is to connect our business school with the broader business community. Uh, and so be, we're uh, associated with a, a Christian church or we're a Christian institution. So very often I'm out uh, meeting with Christians in business. Uh, and over the last decade, I've just had innumerable coffees and lunches and dinners and breakfast and so forth. Uh, and when I stand back from all of that uh, and, and sort of ask what some general impressions have come out, uh, one of them uh, is this. Uh, that with some very happy exceptions, by and large, it seems to me that Christians in business uh, have a very well-developed business worldview, uh, but by contrast, a fairly anemic Christian worldview. And, and one of the consequences uh, of that is that very often their understanding of business and how business should be done ends up shaping what they think about God or God's desires as opposed to their understanding of God and what it means to be a disciple shaping how they do business. And so one of the challenges it seems to me is can we speak into this anemic worldview and begin to develop a more robust theology for Christians in business? The second kind of challenge, or I suppose related challenge that I have, comes out of sometimes when I'll ask Christians in business, how is it that you see your work contributing to the advance of God's kingdom? And a lot of times what I'll get is some answer that goes something like this. Well, Jeff, you know, in my job, I, I make a lot of money, and I can use this money uh, for, you know, doing good things like a missionary or supporting my church or uh, giving to the poor. And, and of course, I want to affirm that. God calls us to stewardship of the resources that he entrusts to us. It's, it's a good and important thing. But when I'm in a snide mood, I want to point out that even bank robbers can tithe. <laughs> and the mere fact that you're doing something good with the money doesn't say anything at all about the underlying activities. And what I'm interested in is a theology uh, that can begin to speak to the day-to-day -day business stuff buying, selling, hiring, firing, reading a balance sheet, setting up a supply chain, and, and ask, how does that stuff itself contribute to the advance of God's kingdom? So another question that I have uh, sometimes run into uh, is the notion that, uh, well, I'll ask the question this way. I'll say, how is it that you being a Christian in business, how do you do, how, what, what difference does that make? And here the answer, I'll guess, again, is sort of a kind of a sheepish, well, Jeff, you know, uh, business is business. I, pretty much everybody does business the same way. It's a little bit like, you know, chemistry. If you take two atoms of uh, hydrogen, one atom of oxygen, you put it together, you're going to get a molecule of water, and it doesn't really matter whether you're a Christian chemist or a non-Christian chemist. And business is kind of like that, but because I'm a Christian, I try to be a little bit nicer. <laughs> when I'm in a snide mood, I call this one Enron with a smile. <laughs> Because you see, the, the underlying message here is that what God cares about, really, is my sort of personal piety 
my personal set of ethics in the workplace, am I kind, am I honest, am I respectful, but that somehow all that other stuff is immutable. It's like gravity. Uh, and, and the best a Christian can do is bring his or her best self to that given reality, but that's just not true. I mean, business is a social construct, and God cares a lot about how it is constructed. And so it seems to me a more robust theology could help us better understand when these dominant paradigms, the dominant structures of our day, are in alignment or out of alignment with God's will. You know, underneath this business is business kind of response is, I think, actually a very kind of dangerous dualism, uh, a, a, just a bad philosophy. Because a lot of times when I'm meeting with these Christians in business, they actually have a fairly well-developed sense of what it means to be a faithful disciple of God in many different uh, areas of their lives, their family life, their church life, their neighborhood. Uh, they, they understand what it means for their behavior. They should have daily quiet times, stay away from pornography, uh, go uh, help out their neighbor's kid when he's going through a rough patch. And again, that rolls into work. They're going to be kind to their employees, give a solid day's work for their boss, be respectful and straight with their vendors, all of that kind of stuff. But again, implicit in all of that is that there's this whole other realm over here, the, the actual nuts and bolts of business, that somehow is kind of outside of what God cares about or outside of God's sphere. There's a very famous Dutch theologian politician, Abraham Kuyper, and he, and he says this, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ does not cry, mine. When I was in uh, college, uh, I heard over and over from an InterVarsity group at that time, said, if Jesus Christ is not Lord of all, then he is not Lord at all. And so what we really need is a theology that is robust enough uh, that it can break apart this dualism or t and put it back together as an integrated whole. Now, I said that there are some uh, both uh, challenges, but I also think there's a tremendous opportunity right now. I, I don't know if you share my opinion on this, but it seems to me that I'm hearing from all across the board more and more people asking questions about the way business is being done. And of course, you have your, your Occupy Wall Street sort of crowd, but I'm talking really more about it coming out of organs that are normally very pro-business in their orientation. The, I think they've just finished, but the Financial Times has been running a series called Capitalism in Crisis, an investigation into the future of capitalism, scrutinizing its legitimacy, its weaknesses, and suggesting ways in which it could be reformed. I'm told this year at Davos, where the rich and powerful gather, they've been talking about how can we change or modify a 20th century capitalism to make it work in the 21st century. Bill Gates, no minor capitalist himself, uh, is now promoting a creative capitalism. John Mackey, the CEO and founder of Whole Foods, talking about a conscious capitalism. You know, and in your area, you have the Co Roundtable. You have a, all sorts of folks who are beginning to say across the board, isn't there another way of doing business? Nobody wants to get rid of capitalism. Nobody thinks socialism is a good idea. But fundamentally, isn't there another way that we could approach this whole business that would make it work better for all of us. And so it seems to me this is a wonderfully ripe time for Christians in business if they had a deeper theological framework to be able to speak into this discussion and really move the needle in terms of the way the world is thinking about and the way, in fact, business is practiced. So that's part of really what deeply animates me and probably the source of much of my passion around, around this topic. So let me, um, let me turn now to this question of why. What is the purpose of business? When I say this, when I pose this question, here's kind of a mental picture I have. Imagine that God is sitting in heaven with a blank piece of paper, and he is about to write down the mission statement, not for any business, but for the institution of business as a whole. From God's perspective, what is the purpose of business? I remember uh, trying to talk to my dad about this. My dad is a, a mild-mannered professor of electrical engineering, kind of a quiet, unassuming sort of fellow. And I was explaining to him that our, our faculty were wrestling with this question of purpose. And uh, I could see him getting more and more agitated. Uh, and then finally, in, in a way that somewhat uncharacteristic, I mean, he, he interrupts me. And he says, Jeff, come on, everybody knows the purpose of business. 
The purpose of business is to make money. Or as we like to say in a slightly more sophisticated fashion in business school, to maximize the return on shareholder investment. <laughs> and in fact, I believe that that remains, although there are certainly strong counter forces now, I believe that remains the dominant understanding of business purpose that governs the actions of most corporate leaders, managers, particularly in publicly traded corporations, but also in private corporations. And uh, I can tell you for sure, undergirds the vast majority of all business school curriculum. That still is kind of the dominant view. Milton Friedman, the sort of patron saint of this view, is at least reputed as having said, the business of business is business. Well, with all due respect to Milton Friedman, I'd like to suggest uh, that that, is, that view is at least inadequate uh, and probably just wrong. And let me tell you, in a sense, how we, our faculty and I, uh, have gotten to this conclusion. So we've been trying to look at, uh, it, really we gathered back uh, almost a decade ago and began to ask biblically, theologically, how could we think about, how could we approach business? And as we began to ask that question, there would have been a number of ways that we could have gone after it. Uh, but we decided that we would use an approach that is sometimes called the grand narrative. Uh, as you know, our scriptures are comprised of all sorts of different uh, genres, all sorts of, we got lists and poems and proverbs and biographies and apocryphal literature and histories, uh, and, and they're all sort of mushed together. And of course, there are many, many little stories. And usually when you hear a talk or a sermon, you're hearing one of the little stories explained. But if you stand back uh, and take a look at scripture as a whole, from beginning to end, it tells one big story the grand narrative. And you can divide this up in different ways, but we chose a fairly conventional approach, uh, at least from a reform perspective. We saw it in four movements, creation, fall, redemption, and new creation. And we began to then ask, what do each of these movements through this grand narrative have to teach us, to have to tell us about business? And when we got to the question of purpose, we found ourselves, at least initially, and frankly, most of our time, focusing on the creation account. Now you might say, well, why? Creation is just two chapters, Genesis 1 and 2, out of the whole of Scripture. But the reason that we ended up focusing just on creation, or at least initially on creation, is this. If you want to get a glimpse in Scripture of what God's perfect plan was for the world he set up, and admittedly, it's just a glimpse, but if you want to get a glimpse, that's where you need to look because Genesis 1 and 2 records God's perfect plan before sin gets in there and, and mucks it up. And so we said, let's, let's start with those two chapters. And so we began to make a number of observations. And I can't go through all of this with you today, but let me just hit a few of the high points. Again, many of these very obvious. Uh, the first one was that Adam and Eve, and therefore all of us, were actually assigned work to do in the garden. This seems so self-evident. If you just read through, you can catalog the, the tasks that have been delegated. But I'm still amazed at how many times I will run into Christians who somehow have in their mind uh, that work was part of the curse, that it was only because Adam and Eve had uh, kind of screwed things up that we have to work. And otherwise, if they hadn't, we'd just be wandering around in the same garden with grapes falling in our mouth. But, but that's not God's picture. In fact, in, in the uh, 26th verse of the first chapter, uh, Adam and Eve, male and female, were said to have been created in God's image. Now, theologians have debated down through the years what that could mean and how could the creature carry the glory of the creator. You could go on and on about that, but in a very simple-minded way, if you just start at the beginning and read down to verse 26, you don't know very much about God except this. You know God was a worker. God created things. And every time he created something, he said, oh, that's good, and that's good. And when he finished the whole thing, he said, that's very good. And if we are made in the image of God, it says to me that we were made in part to express aspects of our identity in meaningful and creative work. So then we made a second observation. The second observation also comes out of that same verse, uh, verse uh, or chapter 1, verse 26. This is a quote of God speaking. Let us make man, generic, humanity, male and female, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Notice the plurals. Most theologians believe this is the first reference to the Trinity 
that we find in Scripture. And it's a reminder that our God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in loving relationship with one another. And here's the key piece. God exists in relationship before God did anything. That is, task comes out of relationship and actually is intended to come back for the glory of, the benefit of, the relationship. And that was God's pattern, and so he, that's the pattern that then is replicated in humanity. In chapter 2, he looks down and says, well, it's not so good that Adam's all by himself. I'll create Eve. We'll put Adam and Eve together so that out of that relationship, they can do the work that they were called to do. It could come back for the benefit of that relationship, or as the community gets bigger, they can do work out of the community and come back for what we sometimes refer to as the common good. But that work comes out of relationship. So we thought, we said, wait a minute. There's a lot of tasks that are delegated to humanity uh, in Genesis 1 and 2 that don't seem to fit business very well. But this is what business does. Business brings people together in relationship in order that together they can engage in meaningful and creative work. And so we said to ourselves, I'll bet that's the first purpose on God's mission statement for business. Business exists to provide opportunities for individuals to express aspects of their God-given identity in meaningful and creative work. We went on. The third observation, this is really obvious, the material world matters to God. You know, we talk a lot these days about spirituality in business. Uh, it seems to be a much more accepted place in a secular uh, workplace to talk in terms of spirituality. Our business school has one unit spirituality and business courses. There's a journal of management, spirituality, and religion that meets sort of academic standards. Uh, so we talk a lot about spirituality, but I'll tell you, if you were to go into Genesis 1 and 2 and read the whole thing, you're not going to find very much in there that's, that's kind of ethereal, spiritual. I mean, clearly scripture affirms that we have spirits and souls, but in Genesis 1 and 2, it's talking about stuff. God makes dirt, and he makes trees, and he makes things you can touch. And this is good for those of us in business, because by and large, business deals in material things or services to meet material needs. This is why this is a good reminder that God doesn't just care about saving souls. He also cares about feeding stomachs, because the material world matters to God. And then we had one fourth observation. And frankly, this is the one that... Uh, was hardest for me. This is a verse that comes out of, let me hold on that. It's a verse that comes out of chapter two, but here's, here was the observation. The Garden of Eden, as originally designed by God, was not complete. Now, when I first heard this, I thought, no, wait a minute, this is God's perfect design. How could it not be complete? Now, my picture of perfection was really a picture of kind of a postcard, a static picture of perfection. And if only Adam and Eve had not eaten that forbidden fruit, we'd still be wandering around in that garden and chomping on grapes that would fall into our mouths. That, that was kind of this fixed picture. But it turns out that's not the image that comes from a careful reading. A careful reading suggests that the Garden of Eden was perfect in the sense that it was perfectly resourced. That is, it was, it was intended to be dynamic. It was, it was all ready to go. If you want to think of it in business terms, it was perfectly capitalized. It had everything that was needed. But if you take a look at this verse that's uh, here, this is from chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. It says in a, in a paraphrase, there was these fields that God made, but there were still no crops. Why? Two reasons. One, because God hadn't sent the rain. Okay, that makes sense. But two, because as of yet, there was no human beings there to t till the soil. And what you get from this picture is the sense that as part of God's original perfect design, he intended this perfectly resourced garden to flourish, to develop, to grow in, and you have to put this word in quotes because it's always a dangerous word, but in a partnership between God's activity and the, act and the activity of humanity. That that was part of God's design that we were to cause the flourishing of this garden, that all of the creative and innovation and new developments were embedded in the soils of the garden as part of God's original intent. And in fact, that's how God intended to provide for his people. 
by and large, Martin Luther says, when you and I do the work that God has given to us, we become the hands of God. That's how God feeds. Didn't have to do it that way. God could have said, what I'm going to do is feed my people every day by dropping little flakes of bread down from heaven. I mean, he actually did that, of course, for a brief period of time, manna flakes. And if that was God's original design, we probably just walk around, go out for breakfast, and, ah, and then come back for lunch. Ah, I'm not sure what we would do in between because we wouldn't need to work. But it, it, that wasn't what God did. God said, no, instead what I'm going to do is make people who are capable of pooling their resources, we call that capital, so they can design an oven, innovation, so they can gather supplies in the supply chain, so they can bake bread in operations, so they can put it on trucks, that's logistics, and send it out to feed a hungry world. And that's what business is for. Business provides the goods and services that enables the community to flourish. And we said, ah, look, I think we've got our second, our second purpose. Business exi exists to provide goods and services that will enable the community to flourish. So we put those two together, and we said, look, I think we've got the mission statement. It exists to provide goods and services that will enable the community to flourish, and it provides meaningful opportunities or opportunities to express aspects of your identity in meaningful and creative work, and that's what business is for. Sometimes we, we shorthand that to say business exists to serve, but when we say that, we mean it in this particular way. Now, you'll notice that I have said nothing in here about profit or return on investment. Uh, and sometimes when I give this talk, I get to this point and I get what I call the ah, come on critique. Ah, come on, Jeff. You're the dean of a business school, for crying out loud. You mean to tell me your school doesn't care about profits and return on investments and efficiencies and all that stuff? And the answer is, of course we do. We have a fairly conventional program. We teach all those things, cost of capital, all that stuff. But here's the difference. We don't teach profit as the purpose. It's not the end. Profit is the means of attracting the capital that enables the business to do what it's supposed to do, which is to serve. Now, if you think about that for a minute, you'll realize that I'm suggesting that we may want to turn the dominant paradigm upside down. The dominant paradigm says, yes, we should, by and large, provide people meaningful uh, work to do. Why? Well, it will reduce turnover, increase retention, more money, more profitability. Yes, by and large, we should provide goods that the community enjoys and it will cause to flourish. Why? Increase sales, more brand loyalty, more money for profits. What I'm suggesting is what if we looked at it as the other way around? That is that profits were the means that enabled us to attract the capital that allows the business to do what it's supposed to do. Sometimes when I get to this point, people say, Jeff, Jeff, you're mixing up a not-for-profit with a for-profit because, you know, a not-for-profit is about serving. And a for-profit, well, that's for profit. And I say, no, uh, you're mixing up purpose and tactic because I think a not-for-profit and a for-profit and a social enterprise there somewhere in the middle of that spectrum, all across that spectrum, exists to serve. Now, they serve different ways, they serve different constituencies, but they exist to serve. They have very different tactics as to how they fund their operations. Typical not-for-profit funds its operations by saying, could I have a little more? Could I have a little more? Whereas a for-profit generates sufficient revenue to pay a reasonable risk-adjusted rate of return and to attract the capital that's needed. Very different tactics, but a common purpose of service. I mean, think of it this way. Imagine a, a large not-for-profit, I, I don't know, um, American Lung Society. And you go to the, the executive director of the American Lung Society and you say to her, why does your organization exist? Don't you think it would be weird if she said, we exist to raise funds? No, you'd want her to say, we exist to promote scientific research for the cure of lung disease or something like that. Now you could ask a second question, what do you spend most of your time doing? Oh, we're always out trying to raise funds. The same is true of business. Why do you exist? We exist to serve. What do you spend a lot of your time doing? Oh, we have to really focus on the bottom line. I sometimes get accused of, of kind of denigrating profit or of suggesting it's not important or that it, it shouldn't be valued. Nothing could be further from the truth. I, I have huge respect for people that are able to run, particularly over the long term, profitable businesses. It takes hard work. It takes foresight. It takes cleverness. A lot of times it takes luck. Enormous respect for that. 
I think profit is critically important. It's just not the purpose. I, I, I give you one last analogy. Think about um, blood. If I don't have blood circulating in my body, we don't need to spend a lot of time talking about my purpose because I'm dead. <laughs> if you don't have profit circulating in a business, you don't have to talk about business's purpose because it's dead. But which of us really gets up in the morning and says, today I'm going to live to circulate blood? No, it's, it's necessary, but it's not the purpose. So that's, what, that's where we come down, that the purpose of business exists, business exists from God's perspective to serve in these two key ways, by providing meaningful and creative jobs and by providing products and services that will enable the community to flourish. So let me turn to my second question. How should business be practiced? And, and here I think it's really important that we put purpose and practice together. Uh, let, me, let me give you a, a metaphor. Imagine, it, it, when I talk about practice, what I'm really asking is what are the kind of boundary conditions that business should respect as it pursues this legitimate purpose? And, and so let me give you a metaphor. Imagine that business is this mighty river and it's racing down the hill. The destination, where it's going to, uh, that's kind of like the purpose of business, the sea. And it's critical that we get that correct. But there's so much volume of water in this river that unless there are levees along the banks, the river's gonna spill out and do damage to the surrounding countryside. And so the question on this, when I'm asking practice, I'm talking about is what are the limits? What are the boundary conditions? I don't think you can really understand God's perspective on business unless you have both of these together. I'll give you another analogy. Imagine that I knew absolutely nothing about American football. And you said, come on over and watch the Super Bowl. And I said, well, you know, it'd be kind of a waste of time. I wouldn't know what was going on. You said, come over an hour early, and I'll explain the game to you. So I go over. And imagine during that hour that what you explain to me is the object of the game, to have more points than the other team. And you get points by moving this funny-shaped thing down to the other end or kicking it between the sticks. And if that's all you told me, and I watched the game, surely I would understand it better. I, I would know kind of what they're trying to achieve. But there would be lots of stuff I still wouldn't understand. I wouldn't understand, for example, why every three tries they end up kicking the ball to the other team. This is a question we ask a lot in Seattle with the Seahawks. But, <laughs> but, but you know, there's a bunch of things. I wouldn't understand why they didn't jump in from the boundaries and tackle that guy running down the side or knock the quarterback down before the ball's hiked because that would be a lot better defense. You see, what I wouldn't understand is the rules. But if on the other hand, I'd got there and all you talked to me about for that first hour were penalties in the game of football, I would understand a lot of things. I'd know why there were just 11 people on the field and why the offensive guys don't just grab that chin strap of the defense and pull them down. I'd, I'd get some of that, but I wouldn't understand really because I wouldn't know what they were trying to accomplish. It's only when I know the object of the game and the rules of the game that I really get the picture. And similarly, I think it's only when we understand the purpose of business and the limits, the boundary conditions, that we really get the picture. So where do we go with this? Well, for us, what this took us to was in a sense, primarily that second great movement, the movement we call the fall. You remember the story, Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, God says, you can have anything you want, but don't eat from that one tree that's in the middle of the garden. The serpent comes along and says, oh God, God just you know, doesn't want you to have that because if you do, you'll be like God. Fundamentally, the temptation to Adam and Eve in the garden was this. Will you live as a limited creature? Will you be limited in your characteristics? Or will you be wanting to be like God, that is, without limits? You see, we never can describe God by the boundaries. Every time you try to build a box and put God in it, the box always gets blown open. God is always bigger than our boxes. But humanity was not created to be like God. And humanity was created to live within limits. And as a linchpin for all those limits, in the very center was this one tree. It was, it's not on the edge of the garden. It was at the middle of the garden. It was very much at the centerpiece of their identity. Would they respect the, their role as limited creatures? And you know the story. They don't. Uh, they eat from the tree, and instantly, everything is broken across every dimension human God. Before God used to come walk in the garden with them in the cool of the afternoon, now when God shows up, they run and hide. In between the two of them, 
Before they were perfectly comfortable being with each other, they eat from the tree, all of a sudden they're concerned that they're naked and they run and hide. The relationship between humanity and the rest of the created order. You know that in the curse, it's the ground that is cursed and thorns and thistles come up from that point on. Or even the precious gift of work, which was intended to be this wonderful expression of identity, now gets distorted, it gets hard. It's only by the sweat of their brow that Adam and Eve are gonna be able to sustain themselves. At the fall, everything gets wrecked. Now, the question is, in a sense, what were the nature of these limits? There, of course, was the limit of the tree. But I think the limit of the tree was symbolic for some very natural limits that existed in the garden before it was disrupted. And we get a couple hints of this, actually. In Genesis, we have this, I mean, many of you may not have focused on this, I never used to. Adam and Eve were originally designed to be vegetarians. Uh, and they were given, specifically, every seed-bearing plant or fruit with seed in it. One implication of that, I think, is they were allowed to eat what they needed without destroying the underlying productive capacity of the garden. Similarly, in chapter one, they were told that they were to rule over and have dominion. These are strong words. But in chapter two, they are told that they are to use that dominion in a way that guards, protects, sustains the garden. I think these are hints of a word that we see later. It's actually not used in Genesis 1 and 2, but I think it describes the garden, and it's the word in Hebrew, shalom. Uh, every time shalom shows up in our scriptures, we, almost every time we translate peace. But that's a very thin translation because it, peace for many of us is just the absence of conflict. This shalom is the kind of positive, dynamic peace that comes from everything being in its right place, everything being kind of in a harmonious balance, sort of in a long-term sort of sustainable way. And it seems to me that if we're going to run businesses that get back towards what God intended from the beginning, possibly, and, and I'm not totally convinced of this, but possibly one way that we could describe these boundary conditions would be to move in on this word sustainable. That is, we ought to operate our businesses in a way uh, that is sustainable. Now, John Wesley, in his General Rules of Moral Living, has two introductory guidelines. Uh, one of them is, do good. Whatever you do, do good. That's kind of our purpose statement. The other is, do no harm. And in a sense, sustainability, as I'm using it, might be thought of as a kind of a Hippocratic oath for business. As business pursues these godly purposes, it should do so in a way that does no harm. Now, typically, when we talk about sustainability, let's see where I catch up on my slides here, uh, we, we talk about uh, it in the United States primarily as an environmental issue, and, and certainly it has that. But I'm told that this concept in Europe is understood much more holistically, and I certainly am meaning it in that sense. That is, it needs to be sustainable across every dimension of the business, across all of what we sometimes refer to as stakeholders. So specifically, what might this mean? Well, it means, for example, I can't take a capital from an investor and not pay a reasonable risk-adjusted rate of return because otherwise I'm just using up the capital and that's not sustainable. But similarly, it means that I can't hire somebody and not pay them a livable wage. Because if I, as a business, take up their entire productive capacity and don't give them enough to live on, that's just not sustainable. As an aside, I think that's one of the reasons Christians should be at the front end of the livable wage movement in this country. And you can go right down this list. In summary, at this point, what I would say is that by and large, what we're aiming toward is a business model that says service is my purpose and sustainability marks the boundaries of the options I will choose between. Now you might say, and I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly, what about the rest of scripture? You've just talked about Genesis 1, 2, and 3. There's a, kind of a lot left. Uh, and I don't have enough time to walk you through a lot left. Maybe plug for buying the book, but, uh, <laughs> the, uh, but, but let me give you the, the punchline at the end. In the end, it seems to me, we learn that God never changes his mind that God's intentions as they were originally laid out in the garden continue. And so 
uh, I sometimes use this metaphor to describe this. Imagine that instead of God creating at the beginning the world, what God created was a sailboat. And God said, it's my plan to sail this sailboat. It's my plan to sail this sailboat with you to Hawaii. That's my original design. And you're going to have work to do. That's what we sometimes call the creation mandate. You're going to raise and lower the sails. You're going to plot the course. You're going to steer the boat. And God says, I have work to do too because I'm the wind. And I'm going to blow in the sail. And together we're going to go to Hawaii. Now imagine you go down to the marina and you find uh, that the boat is trashed that the sail is ripped, that there's a hole in the hull, that the instrument panel's been smashed in. The question around purpose is this. In light of the condition after the fall, does God say, you know what, maybe Hawaii's a little far. Let's just kind of go up the coast here a little bit. No. Across the board, what you find is that over and over, God reaffirms God's whole purpose in that long, vast chapter on redemption is to get back what he wanted from the beginning. And therefore, it seems to me the purpose statements that we've derived at the outset continue to be applicable across the board. The purpose of business has not changed, but there is a change. The nature of the work that business is invited to participate in now is different. It's at least got more to it. In the, in the beginning, before the sailboat was, was smashed, you had creative, forward-working kind of work to do, additive work creation kind of work. You were going to steer, you're going to lower and raise the sails moving forward. You still have all that work to do, but now also you have the repair work to do, the redemption to do. We didn't need to talk about redemption, reconciliation, healing, justice in the Garden of Eden because nothing was broken, nothing was lost, nothing was smashed, and there was no injustice. But now after the fall, Business can do both. And one of my friends has said that this actually should appeal to people in business because by and large, most businesses are about either building or fixing. And that's really the new dimension that comes out after the fall is that business can participate in God's work of fixing. Well, I, I've got more. Uh, there are a number of critiques that I get uh, sometimes thrown my way. And if you don't want to during question and answer, I'd be happy to talk about them. But I do want to end uh, with responding to this one question, does any of this really matter? And uh, it matters a lot, and it matters a lot to me, and I suspect will matter a lot to you. There was a recent survey that was done by Harris Poll uh, of workers, a very large survey of workers across the United States, had a number of startling findings, but let me just share two of them with you. One, only one in five American workers is at all excited about the goals of their organization. Another finding, only one in five American workers sees any connection between the work they do day in and day out and the goals of their organization. Now you put those two together and it suggests very few of our workforce today see any connection between the work they're doing 100,000 hours of their life and anything they care about. Now, from business standpoint, that's a productivity concern. But from God's standpoint, what a loss. What an enormous loss. What if we as Christian leaders could go into businesses and help our employees, help the, our coworkers understand that the work we are doing in and of itself is somehow contributing to God's big kingdom agenda? What if we could connect their work to something bigger than them? The other reason it seems to me that's so critical that we think in these terms relates to the enormous problems that are facing our world today. I, I know you know these statistics. 20% of the world's population living in abject poverty, whole epidemics or whole uh, epidemics ravaging whole continents. One of my statistics that I find just scary every time I say it, 25,000 children under the age of five die every day from largely preventable diseases. I mean, if you want to put that in an order of magnitude, we lose a Seattle worth of children every month. These are big problems. And over the years, government and NGOs and others have been working on them and doing some good things. But I'm convinced that until business begins to understand that these are part of their legitimate agenda, that they won't ever get solved. Business is going to shape the world we live in. It can't be any other way because, frankly, business owns so much of the world 
we live in. So for good or for bad, it's going to be business. And as long as the models that we continue to perpetuate suggest that what you're supposed to do is keep your eye trained on that bottom line, we will never raise the horizons of our leaders who begin to ask, how can I deploy my business? How can I take the assets under my control, employing the core competencies of my organization, and begin in a profitable, a business-like way to address some of the biggest problems facing the world? When Christians start asking those questions, when business leaders start asking those questions, I think we're going to begin to see some huge inroads made on some of these huge problems. Amen. Let me just end with one last verse and then I'll, I'll sit down. This is a verse I suspect you've heard many times, but I wonder if you've heard it in this context. In Luke 10, Jesus looks out over the fields and he says, the harvest is ready, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Every time I've heard that growing up, I was thinking it meant missionaries or ministers or maybe nurses. I think it means business people. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send business people with his theology into the world because the harvest is ready. Thank you very, very much.